I'll caveat this. This is my first public speaking engagement, not to a group of people who can harass me. So I, it, you can, but in a very different way. So um, when Rahul said, hey, we'd love you to talk, I'm like, cool, I'd, I'd like to do that. That's kind of interesting. Can you make it an hour? And I kind of went, oh, shit, um, I, don't, I don't know. So I don't have this time drill well, and my intent is to go through it and field questions as we go. So I don't have a Q&A in the end. Um, uh, if there are no questions, I got maybe 15 minutes of material. So do ask um, if, if, don't care what it is, I have a quick little demo to demonstrate, uh, to talk about one of the uh, ways we do things in SAFE. Um, so I brought a PlayStation here to kind of do that and I'll just hop right in. Um, all right, so I'm Tripp. Uh, I've been at PlayStation for about eight years. Uh, we have recently gone through some interesting changes. Um, we merged with our mother company and now we're a much larger organization. Sony Computer Entertainment and uh, Sony Network Entertainment are now one big global happy family. Actually, it's a really good thing, uh, so we're happy about it. Um, I have been doing, I started at Waterfall and then we did Scrum Agile and we moved to SAFE. Uh, so I've done Scrum Master, Certified Product Owner, um, and uh, Safe Practitioner, um, and all that. And we, my group in LA does things a little bit different. We manage projects and people, uh, whereas in other groups, uh, my peers really don't manage the project. So it's my responsibility to make sure that my projects are successful, even though uh, I'm not the product manager and they report to a comply entirely different area, and the QA doesn't report to me, they're entirely different. Um, but the success of the project falls on me and we have to work very collaboratively. Um, and it's, it's been a good experience. And what we found is it drives um, a positive result to getting things done. Because if you just follow a simple process like Scrum and Agile and self-forming teams, things can fall through the cracks and not through mismanagement or anything else. There's lots of nuances, especially with exceptionally highly connected systems like we're working with at PlayStation. Um, so PlayStation Network, we are now Sony Interactive uh, Entertainment, um, merged two companies. Uh, we have locations in San Mateo, San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Madison, Wisconsin, Waterloo, uh, Canada, London, UK, Tokyo, Japan, and we also outsource to Mexico, Argentina, Russia, China, and India. So that means I work in five different time zones simultaneously and across all of those groups. Now, not every group interacts with every group. We try and make them logically smart, um, but the projects I happen to work on, one of the, the main ones is I own the customer service tool that is used globally. So when you call 1-800-PlayStation-has-a-problem, uh, when you talk to someone, they're using the tool my team wrote and developed. Um, we have call centers around the globe, so we have to be supported 24-7, but we don't have the same scale issues. The core commerce platform has to be able to handle 150 million users uh, globally, somewhere, our number somewhere around there. Um, and you can imagine the scale to do that is rather high. We don't have quite those scale issues, we just have a scale issue in diversity of locations and whatnot. I think the Pac-Man tool runs on two servers versus the front and back end of the PlayStation Network is probably about 7,000 servers. So our, our scale's a little bit different. When we get attacked globally by Anonymous, which happens daily, my stuff never gets attacked. They don't know it. I'm totally protected. But when the core platform goes down, my tools are useless because I am dependent on those. So um, figuring out how to work across all these time zones is kind of a challenge. And uh, we adopted SAFE about two years ago. So I, I'm assuming you guys are all Scrum people. This is just a perfunctory slide. The key thing I think to bring up here is the disadvantages. Um, you never plan for more than one or two iterations um, in advance because it's iterative. 
you're not supposed to do that. Um, and it's hard to work across many regions. So co-location is really critical in Agile uh, to really be effective. Um, we get elements of that luxury. So all of my teams are co-located, um, but they depend on the co-located teams in San Diego, San Mateo, and Tokyo predominantly. Um, so yeah, they're co-located just in different locations. So that's a little bit of a challenge that Agile brings. So SAFE, it, anybody here familiar with SAFE? A lot, a little, not at all? Rahul, all right. So SAFE is Scaled Agile Framework Enterprise. Um, it's trying to be agile in an enterprise environment. So th these are their nine core principles. I, I highlighted four of them um, because they really resonated with me and I think it's how I help motivate uh, our new adopters and our new people. Um, taking an economic view, prior to SAFE, I never knew how the company was doing as an individual. I may have because I was a manager or my boss thought it was important for me to know, but that's not a global thing within the company. Every single planning session we do, which is quarterly for us, um, every single employee on the practicing safe knows what our financial results are. Not the detail, but hey, last year we did a billion, this year we did two billion. Yay, billions are good. Um, and you know, you get to see the lines going up where they should and down where they should, and preferably not the other way around. Um, and what I think is really important there is it takes people, specifically on my team, we don't do sexy work. Everything I show you here is not something we do that you can see. Um, it's not something you can tell your friends, hey, I build the PlayStation. No. So you've got to figure out how to connect with these people and make them feel comfortable that, well, that group over there is building the new UI for the new store that's going on the PlayStation 4. That's kind of cool. Um, we don't. But when you see that you impact the bottom line and how, how uh, globally we've done that and what that means, it connects and resonates a little better. Um, uh, assuming variability. So again, I think you guys, if you've done safe, or excuse me, Scrum at all, you understand that it's iterative, it's constantly changing. Um, safe is weird. Uh, some people have uh, dubbed it Scrum Fall because it's Scrum in Waterfall. Um, we plan 12 weeks at a time. I'll get into that a little bit later. So we don't plan one iteration, we plan six. Um, not very agile. Um, not only do we plan six, we literally slot all of our stories into all six iterations for the duration, and we make commitments to you and to you that, oh, I'll have that in 10-2, no problem. Um, so with that inflexibility, you need to build flexibility in. So, so what SAFE attempts to do is you know, variability and preserve our options, allowing for some slack. And um, uh, if things don't come up, we address technical debt. Um, uh, base milestones on objective valuation. Um, again, in, in Agile, you're not always thinking six, eight, 12 weeks ahead. You're thinking this iteration, this is all I'm focused on. We delivered, are our customers happy? Yes, do we have to adapt? Did the demo go well? Do we have to address for the demo? Um, the, the milestones aren't quite as objective, I think. And what, we've tried, what we try to do is, um, uh, get our milestones based on an objective set that goes across all thousand people doing this. So it's kind of a common theme that we work toward. Um, uh, the next one, apply cadence synchronized across domain planning. So before we started SAFE, um, we had some groups doing daily iterations. We had uh, other uh, groups doing weekly, other groups doing two weekly, other groups doing and I understand how they call this Scrum or Agile. Their iterations varied from iteration to iteration. Never really got my head around how th that's kind of Scrum. It is Agile because they were constantly changing. Um, so across the entire company, we have uh, roughly 1,000 people working on two-week cadences and 12-week planning sessions. And 
we have our next two years planned out of when these events happen and you know we adjust for company milestones like oh hey we're launching um the, the next version is dubbed playstation 4.5 and the vr headsets coming out and all that kind of stuff oh planning falls in the middle of launch well nothing is more important than launch yes you said something uh, a couple of bullet points back you said uh Add in some slack space, and if nothing really bad comes up, uh, you uh, you work on technical debt to, yes. to kind of uh, fill in the gap until the next yes. the next set of iterations starts. Um, I assume that means that if the other the opposite happens and you end up taking a little bit too long, yeah. uh, you let quality suffer. Uh, is it, is it Come on, now we never let quality suffer. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's it's a fair point. So one of the things, um, sorry, I'm out of camera now, aren't I? Um, one of the things we have negotiated with our product management group, um, and I'll, I'll, I don't have a slide on this, but I'll talk about it um, a little bit, is all of engineering rolls up to the peer of product management. So no one in engineering reports to product management, yet I don't do anything unless you tell me to do it. Um, we're not nearly that explicit, but we, we try and honor that. Um, so we've been told to allocate 15 to 20% for technical debt in general. I get to reserve for my teams. Um, but if you've ever done this, you know sometimes quality does suffer because you have a date, you've made commitments. And I hate saying quality suffers because there's sometimes other ways. Long-term quality may suffer. We may not do an automation aspect of it, so getting hammered by it later we have to address. Um, and because we get a little bit of an ebb and flow, uh, as an example, the first project uh, I did on SAFE was this reboot of the customer service tool. Um, we made a conscious choice not to automate everything, even though we knew it was wrong. We had some dates we had to accomplish and there were some politics behind it, and we made a conscious choice, um, forget all automation, everybody's focused on this, we get to ship, and then we'll shift. And our automation lead said, bullshit. I said, no, but really, I mean it. This time, we won't not go back and do it. And we did go back and do it. Now, that was eight months ago we released that. And we are not at what we would consider 100% automation. Um, I will argue that there's no such thing as 100% automation uh, in software, nor should there be. But what we call, we, our definition of done is automation, automated, automated where applicable. Certain UI elements don't make sense to automate. Um, and we are going back and using our technical debt um, allocation to address that. So we, we try and do it that way. Um, I'll say quality never suffers in that iteration. It suffers long term because yeah. we make some optimization choices. It sounds like that's uh, another way to say that is you, you actually do have some variability in scope. It's just the automation part is the scope that you sometimes uh, have to defer. Yes. To very true, and it also depends on what you're working on. I work on a back-end tool, and I can tell my customer, don't touch that. Because yeah. if I know it blows up the server, I can just say, don't touch that, or someone's going to fire you. And they won't. If you say, don't touch that on this screen, <laughs> you know what happens. So it kind of depends on, on the uh, domain space you're in, too. We, in, in the projects I work on, most of them, we have a lot more flexibility to play with scope. Whereas um, when the team who has to deliver me the API that allows me to tell a customer that this is happening, yeah, they, they, they're a lot less flexible in that. So um, that answer your question? Okay. Um, and then I think the other one that's really important and kind of odd given that we're a Japanese company, if you've ever worked for a Japanese company, decentralized decision making, quick decision making, good communication, none of those apply. Um, we really are trying to do decentralized decision making. And what that, what that means is, and I'll get into this a little bit later, um, you have high level scope in product and project and vision, but when it comes down to the actual implementation, it's whatever me and you negotiate is okay, as long as we can get to that end goal together. We don't need to go up to the closest VP and say, hey, Adam and I made this decision to go do this, and is that okay? No, for the most part, 
those decisions happen on a scrum team level. So um, that's the, the other core principles are important, um, but I think those are the ones that really resonate with me. Yes. Uh, you know, that's a good point. I tend to focus on that stuff myself more than some of my counterparts. Um, I don't think that's unique to SAFE. I think that's part of Scrum. That's part of Agile in, in basically allowing groups to self-form and, you know, hey, you want to work on that story? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's a new story for you or that's a new technology for you? Please go ahead and do that. Um, and allowing that kind of flexibility, I think, is what does that. So I don't think that's particularly unique to SAFE. It's one of their core principles, but I would say that's kind of a core Scrum principle. Do they have, I'm just curious, do they have practices that map to that, like specific things that they do in SAFE that speak to this principle? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. I'm curious. Cause I think you know, and I can't answer that either. I'd have to look into it. I am not a SAFE certified consultant and that kind of stuff. I'm just a guy that's lived with it. I've embraced it. Um, one of the things I'll get into in a minute, the way SAFE is valuable and how it works. In fact, it might be this slide here. Um, what does SAFE bring to the table? Top-down prioritization. So prior to us adopting SAFE, we were mostly an agile company from the network perspective. This little box here makes your life a little bit more difficult to be agile because there's firmware, build of materials. Um, our chips are custom manufactured by AMD and there's tooling and all of these wonderfully complex things that take timelines and whatnot. A little harder to be ha agile on a hardware perspective. Um, but the problem I think we saw was there was no, everybody did a little bit different. And I'll even address that on SAFE, we all do it a little bit different. But we do it a little bit different within confines, whereas before, I think I mentioned, we had some groups working on daily iterations and some groups on a variable iteration. Really hard to plan and negotiate with people when they're like, well, I haven't planned that because that's tomorrow. But I can't do anything until I know when you're going to deliver me an API because I don't want to work on this until you get to it. So what, what I found really interesting here is, our senior management, um, Kadera San, who's our, our top executive uh, at PlayStation Network, said, um, we're going to do SAFE. And he brought all of uh, the managers in, and we went through the two-day training, and a lot of people did a lot of eye rolling. And I was kind of one of them, but I was optimistic of like, this is interesting. Let's see how this plays out. Um, and what it really allowed us to do is, as my second bullet denotes there, pulling the disparate groups together. Um, we're a highly collaborative organization prior to SAFE, but it wasn't always constructive collaboration or even positive collaboration. It was, uh, I didn't get my stuff done because of that guy, girl, sorry. Um, and now there's a lot less of that because there's a much greater transparency and whatnot. Um, and I think that is really good. Um, the other key thing, especially um, from my perspective, everything about what you see here is interdependent. There are 700 people who make this screen available. And I'll go into a little detail on that uh, in a couple minutes. I apologize, I had planned to put that on, up on the big screen, but there's some technical difficulties with that. Um, and almost none of our five to 700 developers writes code that isn't dependent on someone else. So it's really difficult to, when you're so highly dependent um, in so many different ways, um, if you don't have some kind of a dependency management system. SAFE is one of those things. Yes? Um, so just to rewind a bit, is, is SAFE free or is it proprietary? Is it paid for? You know, someone asked me that just the other day because we were talking about this and I have probably have some slides or uh, graphics in here that are not properly licensed. Um, I don't think you pay 
to use it per se, I think you may pay to get certified and to use some of their training materials. But my understanding is we probably, Sony play, pays a licensing fee, um, mostly because we're a large enough organization where we started with an outside consultant and now we have no outside consultants. We all internally consult. So we have certified uh, safe um, trainers and career coaches inside the company. And in order to have access to that information, uh, I think we pay a fee, but. Does safe come from a for-profit company? Um, it comes from, oops, scaled agile framework um, comes, I can't answer that. You know what? I'm stumbling along. I'm not 100% certain on that. Um, it's, it's some of the group that founded the Scrum principles broke off and understood that for large organizations, your typical agile uh, environment doesn't always work. I, I think that the most interesting one we had was we found out we were launching this little piece of equipment here uh, the same time you did. Oh, and by the way, we've got to deliver for it. So the, the uh, example that was given to us is Kaz Harai, who's the global CEO of Sony, gets up on a stage at CES and says, by the way, the PlayStation 4 is going to be in your hands in November. And a, a few of us, obviously the hardware people have been working on this for a long time, but some of us that are delivering some of these network dependencies are like, I wonder what that means. Um, we no longer have ability to really work on scope or time. So we're kind of hammered by this. How do we get there and how do we do this? Um, and that was one of the examples they used when they brought it into us, um, is some of these founders of Scrum, Agile, recognize that the utopia of self-forming, self-organized, and a highly motivated people doesn't always work in every circumstance, especially when you have long manufacturing times and lead times and whatnot. Yes? Um, a little bit of both, I think. One, the stuff I was working on at the time and most of the people around me, um, we didn't need as much lead time. There were other people in our organization who were aware of it, but for secrecy, we are not told. Um, it wasn't, there was a few things, and I can't remember what the code name of this project was. Once you heard about it, you're like, oh, that's what Swordfish is. Great, thanks. Um, which has nothing to do with actual fish. It has to do with uh, a Japanese anime. Long story. Um, so yes, there's some of that. And, and then, of course, there's some of it is, of course, that um, you know, the long lead times of the hardware and the design and all that kind of stuff had been going on. But our area, software, hey, we've been telling the mothership software, we can do this. So there's a little bit of that where we shot our own feet, I think, a little bit. So I, I'm not sure. I didn't really answer your question well, but I don't have a great answer for you. I, I can't. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And he also founded Rally Software. So I know the Rally Software does have like the same, you know, tool of set in there. So that would be probably the, the pay aspect. Is that a framework free? Download? Well, yeah, you can actually download their picture and everything. That's awesome. Yeah, and I have the picture in a couple of different iterations here. Um, so yes, and, and we are a Rally shop. We may be moving away from that. I have a small slide there talking about our main tools. Um, I will say Rally's not great for safe, but it does have the aspect of an epic, um, and then stories and then tasks and uh, allowing us to have senior management to say, we're going to launch a device and that's the epic. And then the sub features of that. And then, you know, the actual user stories get down to our groups and we build those ourselves. So is that a little bit better? Okay. Oh. Um, the downside, um, I'll talk about this in a, a few different places, crap load of overhead. If you thought you had a lot of meetings now, wait till you go to safe. You'll have a ton. The difference is who has them. The actual execution team 
not so much. Very little changes, I'll get to that I think in the next slide. Um, but for the product managers, product owners, scrum masters, just goes through the roof. I'll talk about that in a moment. So SIE specific things, uh, greater visibility. So in the beginning of each planning, I'll go into the breakdown of a planning, the, one of the planning days, um, uh, because I, f I find it very valuable myself. It sets the tone for most of what we do. Um, uh, every, there's trains, I'm getting ahead of myself, I apologize. Um, every group that has planning, and we do them in separate rooms, Again, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, a senior executive comes and talks about the business in general, and then more specifically about what it means to this particular value stream. Again, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, improved coordination between portfolio and program management. Uh, those terms will make a little bit more sense in a minute, but it is transparency and uh, collaboration based. Um, I think another great thing, and I'll talk, uh, give a more specific example later, prioritization conflict. It gives you the framework to address the fact that you're not delivering for me and how we address that. And that may be an intentional non-delivery. Um, again, uh, I got a good example for that. And better transparency. Um, Japanese organizations in general are not transparent whatsoever. Uh, we are a US-based organization. We are better at it, but still not spectacular. This helps quite a bit. Um, oh, I was wrong. Um, okay, since the beginning, um, we, did, we started SAFE in, it was February 2014. Um, we've launched six trains. I'll explain that in a moment. We have 700 uh, team members actively participating in it. Um, over 350 production releases, 22 PSIs, I'll explain PSI in a moment, uh, 125 plus sprints, and 250 plus features. Um, I personally believe we've delivered more in the two years that we've been doing SAFE um, than we did in the four years prior. And, and not in raw code, um, I think any of you have seen this, it's in value. And I don't mean esoteric value. I can work on this or this. I chose this, and it was a waste of time. How many times have you done that? We all have. I do that a lot less in SAFE, because I know what everybody around me needs, and I know when I need to deliver it. And if I don't need to deliver it for 12 weeks, I don't work on it until I'm a little bit closer to it, and they're closer to consuming it. Sometimes we do things early because of firmware and um, scheduling and whatnot, but for the most part, we try and do much more just-in-time um, delivery of our dependencies. And SAFE has really allowed us to do that. So I'm always working on the most valuable thing at the moment, instead of, well, I'm not really sure, that's kind of cooler, I'll work on that, but then it never makes it to see the light of day. Yeah, it was cooler, but it didn't really help. Um, and just selfishly, it didn't help my career. I delivered something that nobody cared about, or I delivered something that the CEO was like, that's a really cool feature. I got to work on that, thank you. Um, so this is the SAFE model. Uh, this is the picture you can um, download um, and use, and in fact, I am. And I stole this from one of our own internal uh, display things, hence the Sony network copyright on there. So, there, there's this concept of team, program, and portfolio, and I'll break these down in a moment. Um, I don't think this is terribly different from any organization, and it's a little bit of an eye chart, um, and I'll break, again, I'll break these down so I won't go through them. But at the top level, there's not a lot of changes needed, depending on your organization. There weren't fundamental changes. Um, and at the team level, there's very little changes. The scrum teams execute. They still execute, in our case, on a two-week cadence. I believe that is SAFE's prescription, is a two-week cadence. But they say, they also say your PSIs, which is uh, this, it's, it's PSI stands for Potentially Shippable Increment. And they say it should be 10 weeks. We moved ours to 12. Um, I don't know the reason behind our decision to move it to 12 from 10, but their prescription is 10. So they give a recommendation and then it's like, uh, but it's yours, go do it. Um, I think the big changes are here. Um, 
th this center section, the program, is really the most valuable part of the organization as far as getting us all moving in the right direction. Um, I'm sure everybody's worked in an organization where the CEO or the leaders of whatever it is, it could be your direct leader or the company's leader, has a great vision and you're like, yeah, that, that's cool. I, that speaks to me and I can work toward that. But I'm working on this little widget in this place and it's not obvious about how what I'm working on gets to that vision. That's our middleware piece, the program layer. This is where the big changes are. This is where the tons and tons of meetings are. Tons and tons and tons of meetings. Um, Y'all familiar with a daily stand-up? Scrum, uh, uh, Scrum. So we have Scrum of Scrums, Scrum of Trains, Train of Scrums, and it just it cascades up. So if you're a Scrum master on a key team, you may have four meetings a day, stand-ups, one with your team, and then one with the uh, middle team. And if you have dependencies with another team or another, what they're called, uh, agile release train um, or value stream, um, well, you got to attend all theirs too. It can become onerous for your scrum masters, your product owners, and your product managers. Once you get used to it, well, A, I'll show a slide later where we've changed some of how we do that and we've actually cut a lot of those meetings back. But starting with it, it was painful. So, uh, oh, great, now I get to my demo. It's not a great demo and it'd be better on a big screen, but um, that's all right. What, what I mentioned value streams, art uh, is another name for it, agile release train. We build um, these agile release trains in what they call value streams. So we have one called PlayStation, and if you're on the PlayStation train, and I have a controller that's not working. There we go. Um, I have a team that sits on the PlayStation train, and they do things that you see here. Um, if my network was working a little bit better, you'd see some stuff pop up here that they build, and we all meet globally and we talk about that. It's very obvious, oh, there it goes. Um, and it's all around kind of the visual elements of the PlayStation business and the, the, the network. The actual firmware team, oddly enough, is not part of that train um, because the traditional hardware side of the house does not participate in Agile uh, or Safe or Scrum or anything Agile, remotely Agile, unfortunately. Um, what we've done is we've figured out, because we all now speak the same language on the network services side, they're not having to learn three different terminologies on how to interact with people. When you go to someone in Tokyo and say, hey, during PSI planning, they don't look at you cross-eyed. They go, oh yeah, I know about that. Oh, and we have to do this. And we have, they know about it. So they now, instead of having to figure out how to interact with each team building the things they work on, we'll use a common language. That alone could have been solved in other ways. Safe isn't the only way I've done that. It just happens to be a very convenient way to have done that. Um, so that's one of our big value streams. Um, another one is commerce. And what I was going to try and do was show you that, oddly enough, you can't see commerce because there's nothing about commerce. So if I were to go in here and try and buy something, so far, the commerce train and 150 people, our single largest train, you haven't seen anything they do yet. Um, nothing here is there. I add it to my cart. This is one of the first places you'll see the commerce trains work. And then um, if I proceed to checkout um, and go through this whole flow, that's where the commerce train comes in. It's an invisible train that sits in the background and powers the ability to do somewhere around 100,000 transactions a second. Extremely high transaction volume. Um, because while we don't sell 100 million games a year, we sell a bunch of 99 cent FIFA points if you're a gamer, or this DLC, or all of that kind of stuff. The, those are where the transaction rates start to get really high, small transactions, but lots of them. And the point, what I wanted to illustrate here is this value stream and this, this group of people that works together, um, 
They do something that's invisible. And the other challenge I think SAFE has, um, and we all have had a problem working on this, is when my current team, the customer service tool team, was onboarding onto a train, we said, what train do we go to? We have PlayStation, we have Commerce, uh, we have Account and Identity, um, we have one called Run the Business, which is where our systems architecture system networks and all those people sit. Um, we have a, a it's BIS um, reporting train. Um, and you say, well, I can refund a customer their money. That, that's commerce. We should be on the commerce train. I can change a user's identity. Well, that's account and identity. Hmm, it's probably there. Um, well, we do impact other elements on um, the PlayStation train. So we can sit there. So where do you find the right home? Now, for that tool, it was a little bit easier because the primary thing about uh, the, the customer service tool is account and identity. We do allow for transactions and whatnot, but that's not what it's about. So that was a little bit easier. It took a bit of negotiation to get there. Um, so we sit on the account and identity train, um, and we don't touch the commerce. But almost everything that PlayStation Network does touches commerce. So why don't we just put the entire company on the commerce train? Well, that kind of invalidates the whole purpose of having these separate streams. One of the other streams uh, we have, sorry, is the video train. Uh, I neglected that. And sorry, I'm using a slow network connection here. Um, if we were to go and look at a movie to buy or rent on the PlayStation Network. Sorry, I didn't mean this to be an ad for PlayStation, but it suits my point here. Um, so now, basically, when you hit this tab, this is all the video trains work. Yes, you buy something, it gets handed off to Commerce. They don't deal with that. We don't um, uh, say, oh, well, since you're video and you want so user wants to buy a video. No, we hand that off. Um, and so everything having to do with a video is on the video train. From the ingestion of the content, so the raw data file of that movie, um, those people sit on the video train. Uh, the people who build the video player, um, which you access through here, those people sit on the video train. Um, PlayStation View, a uh, new kind of cable competitor, those people sit on the video train. Yes? <coughs> Was there a third party consultancy that came in and designed your trains and platforms? Yes. And we did have a safe coach come in and sit down with us. Um, presumably you, you design SAFE, you map out all of SAFE before you apply to the organization. Oh, yes. So, so it's like a big change program, really. Um, it's massive, and it's also slow. So we took a more me measured approach. We launched the first train, which was the Commerce train, in February of 2014, as the slide stated. Um, the second train launched 12 weeks later, the third train train 12 weeks after that, the fourth train 12 weeks after that, and then it was a, a year before the next train launched. Um, it is so massive a change. Um, I don't know if we would have been better to do it all at once. It would have been chaos, but we also launched this process as we were starting to ship the PlayStation 4, which as it turns out, if, if you're a gamer, you're aware of the console wars, we've hands down won this version, we'll probably lose the next one. That's kind of how it goes, so if there is a next when one. When you deployed the organizational change, did you also have new tools? Was there any kind of system that came with it? You talked about this Rally. Rally, I, I have a screenshot of that. So Rally, um, deploy Rally at the same time as we were already a Rally shop prior to that, right. but what we weren't is an organized Rally shop we had different workspaces in Rally um, for each kind of logical group. San Diego um, had their own Rally. San Francisco had their own Rally. In Los Angeles, we kind of sit between the two, and for some things we use San Diego, some things we use uh, San Francisco, and some things we use our own. And it was just chaos, because you'd be like, hey, uh, I need to see that story, US 1234. Like, oh yeah, here, go look at it. Oh, I don't have access. Oh, shit, okay. A week later, you now have access. Okay, safe, we use safe to tear down those walls. So we merged Rally into a common workspace 
and we have what's called art, agile release train, and non-art. So I have a couple projects that sit in the non-art workspace and a couple projects that sit in the art workspace. But everybody has access to everything now. Sony is also uh, traditionally a very walled garden organization. I only had access to about half of what I needed. The other half I had to ask and wait two to n number of days, literally sometimes weeks, um, to get access to things. It's another thing we've used SAFE to help us tear some of these walls down. Uh, one second. Um, and so that was useful. So did we deploy new tools? Not exactly. I mean, we were already, already using Rally as our story management, task management, and kind of or, for or us organizing uh, uh, Scrum, our you know, Scrum aspect of it. So that was helpful. Yeah, if you're not even using something like that, there's a um, Jira Greenhopper um, version one and whatnot, a variety of those tools that do the same thing. So, but we did have an agile coach come in and say, this is how you do things. We learned pretty quickly that while that coach was good at some things, he was really good at giving that non-answer that, you know, he'd give the demonstration and the talk and everybody's like, yeah, that makes sense. And you go afterwards and say, hey, um, what do I do in this really specific instance? You know, how do I address that? And he would just go back to the core principles and really wasn't very, you walked away going, I was useless. I have no tool to help me here. So we started building our own internal expertise on how to kind of address this and a series of working groups um, and kind of project management um, took over there. And our PMO organization, I was not terribly thrilled with prior to SAFE. Um, I think they're one of the reasons we've really succeeded in it. They've really stepped up their game and done an amazing job at helping tear down some of these walls. They and sort of led the change. Th yes. Um, I hesitate because it's interesting. In general, yes. There are some bad actors in every organization uh, that aren't good at that. But they really embraced it and saw it as an opportunity to add value where it was really needed and we desperately needed. And they did a really good job in it. So, yeah, Rahul. Just a quick question around like, breaking down the walls. What about like, the people aspect? Do, for example, do all release train, do all teams belong to a single release train? Are they co-located? Do they sit together? Or are they secure? Sort of. Okay. Um, so in our organization, the PlayStation train roughly translates to San Francisco. Uh, commerce roughly translates to San Diego. Um, RTB, run the business, translates to San Diego. Um, and video, it's kind of a mix between Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, and so, yeah, the, the goal is to co-locate them. That's the value. Um, and on, okay, on this side, so right now we have 60 scrum teams actively working in SAFE. One thing SAFE does, and I don't recall this prior to uh, uh, in the previous variant of Scrum Agile we did, they have a very specific criteria of what a Scrum team is. Um, I own three teams that are not officially Scrum teams. They're not big enough. Um, I have a couple of three-person teams. Small, work on small things, at very agile, as it were. Um, but they don't meet the criteria. Therefore, they can't be on a train and they do not participate in the same way as other teams. You have to have a minimum of a five person scrum team and uh, that is at least the developers and a scrum master. Um, uh, in one of mine, I've added the product owner into it to get to that five number to be on the PlayStation train as it were. Um, so you have that aspect of it. And our organization has taken that really seriously. We're really loose in some of the other safe rules. That one they're really anal about. Uh, 10, 11, you start pushing above that and they'll break us up. So my biggest team is 11 and it took uh, an executive to give me an exemption to have a team that large. Um, theory being similar to Scrum, um, too big is not agile anymore. Um, so try and keep it about seven, seven, eight. I think it's 
science um, that backs up the seven to nine number. There's yeah, um, and we fudge on that 11 person team. There were some extraneous people we were counting um, because we were asked to, but they were not core developers or QA or the Scrum Master. They were some, uh, I had a program manager in there, I had a product owner in there. So some arguments can be made that they're not the true Scrum team. Um, so we plan every 12 weeks. Oh, I totally screwed that up, sorry. Um, our iterations are 12 weeks, so we plan six iterations at a time. Occasionally, we'll go to seven iterations to accommodate um, the holiday. Our big release cycle is around Christmas, and uh, we tend to do a November hardware refresh or update. I think this year you'll see our VR headset come out in the November timeframe, get into people's hands for Christmas, that kind of thing. Um, so some of the dates fall um, at bad times. So we, I think we've gone as high as seven uh, iterations and as low as five. But for the most part, yes? What's the difference between a two-week iteration and a 12-week iteration? Um, good question. The, the, the traditional scrum iteration of one to two weeks, whatever, uh, we always were a two-week organization. Um, for the, the groups I worked in. That is your, in this sprint, we will accomplish this, and it's theoretically at the end of an iteration, it's always shippable. And we bundle together um, six of these small iterations to be what we call major releases. We actually do two major releases per 12 week cycle. Um, so it basically, on some of the larger initiatives, when we do our planning, product management says, um, we have a set of communities right now, a social aspect, it's communities. We wanna have official communities. That's our 12 week goal. Well, there's a lot of work and a lot of interdependency of the teams in that. Um, so like most of my stuff is tools related. We gotta build an operational tool that allows someone to create an official uh, forum, and um, they need to be verified in a few other attributes. Well, I can't do a, most of my work until the APIs exist for me to call and, and create these things on some of the other teams. So we break things up and I'll say, look, I need about two iterations to figure this out. When can you deliver the API I need to call and tell you to create this community with this name, run it through the appropriate language filters we have, and whatnot. And they say, well, I, I can't get it to you till here because I have other dependencies. So we sit in our planning and figure out, okay, if you can get it to me, then I'll do it here. And then someone comes to me and says, hey, Trip, by the way, um, I'm screwed. We have a release going out next week and I've got no way to program this content. We need to add it to this tool. Oh, okay, that's kind of important. So we'll figure that out. So we'll do that here. So then this is where that dependency management I talked about earlier comes in, where we sit there and say, we plan six two-week iterations out for 12 weeks and literally slot stories in. And instead of a traditional, I have a um, uh, velocity of 30 points, say. It's 30 points per two-week iteration, and we, we do our t-shirt sizing and point the stories, we throw them in iterations, and we try and logically build them, you know, group that work together. So we're not, we're not working on disparate items. We put them together so they're shippable components. Um, and then we organize things that way. So the cynical person tells me, wants to answer and say nothing. It, 12 weeks, six weeks, what does it matter as long as we get it done in time and get it done to what your dependencies are. Um, but 12 weeks is so amorphous that a lot of the individual engineers, as you're planning these stories out, um, giving them 12 weeks to deliver a piece of code in means they screw off for nine weeks and then they work overnight because a lot of our engineers, that just the mindset is they work towards a deadline. And, and if you give a really long deadline, it doesn't get done. And on these shorter in instances, yeah, they work on that deadline and if they miss it, the impact is much lower. 
And that's, I think, the, the difference really between it is it keeps those impacts of missing those deliverables much lower and much more manageable. Um, uh, demos and retrospectives, who attends them and how frequently do you do them? Um, so on a scrum team level, every sprint. Every sprint, no difference. That's why in the pre one of the previous slides where I showed the whole thing, there's very, very, very little difference to the end team except in the big planning mechanisms where you have to do a lot of work. And then for 12 weeks, your job is exactly the same. The only difference is the planning for each sprint as you're entering from one sprint to the next is 10 minutes. It's nuances of saying, hey, what are we carrying over? Are we carrying too much over into this? Are we gonna have to push things out? Where do we organize? And if you've delivered everything you've committed to, there's almost no planning to do. I'd say 50% of the time we don't deliver everything we commit to. We pre-deliver on some things and we un under-deliver on some others. So over the 12 week it nets out, but there's a little bit of that negotiation. So uh, again, at the team level, every iteration, uh, we do uh, retrospectives um, and safe calls inspect and adapts. Um, at the higher level, that's done every 12 weeks. So at the program level, um, you'll um, see in a later slide where I talk, we, we actually go through and have uh, demos in uh, INAs as they're called, but basically retrospectives. Um, at every 12 weeks. That's where it gets murky. Um, I don't know if you guys have found this. Uh, a lot of developers don't like attending demos or retros because they have nothing to say and they know what it does. I don't need to demo it. Um, I wrote the code, what's the demo, unless you're doing the demo yourself. Um, it's, a, it's one we've adapted to, and we've made demos pretty optional for most of the development team. Um, kind of depends on the circumstances. Um, my argument to the develop, developers are, this is the opportunity to actually see the face of the product manager who you're delivering to, and you understand better than anybody whether you delivered what they wanted or not. So this is a great time there, because you can just read their face and they're like, you guys are the greatest ever. I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was just going to be stupid and this works perfectly. Or, you know, guys, this isn't quite right. Uh, you know, I thought this is what I wanted, but it isn't. You know, what's it going to take to refactor this? Um, it's pretty good feedback. So we've made them optional, but we actually get a reasonable attendance. The program level demos um, almost caused a revolt. They were eight hours because, you, remember, I've got 60 scrum teams doing demos of some pretty esoteric shit. Uh, uh, literally a demo is, see the command line? <laughs> right, and, and then other demos are this, right? So as some developers are like demoralized, I'm like, I can't compete with that, screw that, I'm not coming to this. Um, and so we, it, it's one of the adaptations we made at the program level where now pretty much the demos are done by the product owners only or the product managers. And uh, where they used to take almost all day, they're five or 10 minutes trying to be high level. And they inspect and adapts. Because at that higher level, the individual developer's input is not as valuable at that level because it's more about the developer talks about my group. And then we go up one level and, and the product owner gets the opportunity to say, you know what? You didn't get me that information in time, and we had a real problem. Next time, you need to give me better feedback or X. Um, develop, everybody's welcome to every demo. Um, we are very open in that aspect. Um, but you kind of, it's a time sink. Um, I've, I've got some numbers in there, but I think roughly it cost us one man year to do a demo. It's a shitload of money and time. So we, we kind of cut back. We didn't cut back because we were trying to save money though. We cut back because everybody was angry about it. Not like, hey, I'm not sure that was a good use of my time. Pissed off is the best way to describe how upset they were about, I spent all day doing this, I could have written something valuable. So it's the safe aspect of it really worked. People were like, no, I'd rather do something valuable, yes. 
any changes you notice in employee satisfaction or engagement? I mean, I know it's rough usually during the change. But yeah, it's hard. Um, because there are four ecosystems, five ecosystems in PlayStation Network. So in the LA office where I'm based, um, SAFE benefited all of us tremendously. Our scope increased, our visibility to the global organization increased. Um, to the San Diego organization, it was very painful change. And there was a lot of change at that time too. Uh, senior management went through an upheaval. Um, lots of negativity. So, depends who you talk to and where. Overall, I think it has increased quite a bit. Where I have difficulty answering your question is, how much of it is safe? How much of it is the old guard leaving? How much of it is the new uh, management style we used to be a, a very scrappy organization. We were effectively a startup. We're not anymore. We're a mature organization. The leader we have now cares more about who you are and your kids and your family and are you happy working here and what is it going to take for you to be happy here? And he translates that into, you know, we're doing fun, interesting stuff. We're delighting the customers and that should be fun for you. You should experience the technology. Everybody should have one of these. Everybody should have a smartphone. Everybody should have these devices. Whereas before, it was a little bit more of our CTO sitting Christmas Day in the data center rerouting networking cables. Little bit of a <laughs> different, oh, and screaming at everybody. Oh, um, so, so much change has happened at PlayStation Network, it's really hard for me to say, oh, well, SAFE has made everybody happy. No, it's made a lot of people angry. Made a lot of people grumpy. Not really angry, but it gives you something to bitch about, which is sometimes, sometimes valuable, right? Because you'd be like, ugh, safe. I just spent two days doing nothing in planning. Yeah, and then that's annoying, and then you go away, and for 12 weeks, you have a clear vision. You know where to go, and that first, for me personally, that first two hours of planning is amazing because you find out what you did and the value you delivered. And, um, you know, in, in, in my neighborhood, it's more about the fact that our downtime went down and that saved the company about $30 million over the course of the year. That's because of me. Now, I didn't generate $4 billion in revenue, but I saved $60 million. That's real money. Um, so I, I can take out of it what I want, um, and I think that that's really positive, and so you get a lot of that, and you get a visibility... Uh, the individual developers, I think, and I say developers, I do mean QA. I, I, I think of them as a group. We've actually, I'm trying to not hire any QA. I'm hiring an engineer. I don't want a QA person. I don't want a developer. I want an engineer. And that scrum team is responsible for quality, and I don't care how you get it done. Um, it's through automation. It's through QA. It's all of that, and the entire unit is responsible for it. So that's why I kind of bundle those things together. Um, you get to go and sit and see something you never had the visibility into of how you impacted things. And so we have a lot of non-gamers at the company and I'm kind of pseudo gamer. New game just came out, it's really good, Uncharted, get it if you're a gamer. Um, and I love it and then I'll be done with it and I won't probably game for a year or two. Um, so I've got this thing that I work on that yes is cool to talk about outside but doesn't mean a lot to me um, personally, but seeing that it means a lot to a lot of people, gives me a value I can take home other than it's something that I don't use. So for me, I see the value and I try and expose, expose that to my engineers and whatnot. Some people are just like, eh, shut up, you're a cheerleader, go away. I mean, that's really my job is get people excited to do their work and do it well. Because when I've done it right, they go do it and I don't do anything. So when it works, I have very little work to do. It's only when it doesn't work when I have a lot of work to do. So, um, answer your question? Okay. Um, so, uh, 60 scrum teams, and if you figure there's, oh, seven to eight people per scrum team, that's a lot of people getting together and doing things in a common form. Um, and, you know, nothing new here. The user story and value deliver user stories, that's just scrum agile. There's nothing unique there. 
Um, the key roles, I think, um, not terribly different. Um, product management is not actually called out in here. They're not part of at the team level, but they're the ones who give us that this is what we want to do view. And then our product owner and the, the team itself break that into the stories and the actual work. So you can have the most amazing product manager in the world, but if I don't buy what it, they're saying, it's useless as an individual contributor. Um, and um, so we take that and we try and customer service tool, I try and take all of the engineers out to sit on the floor and watch the employees be frustrated trying to help someone. And every single one of those people comes back and says, ah, I have an idea. And they're usually nuances, little things, not big, let's do this feature that's going to take us 12 weeks and derail the roadmap. No, it's that little thing that I notice they click that button three times. They don't use any of those interim screams. We can just make those disappear. So that's the value, I think, of having that product manager really close to the team. Yes? I know there's some product manager people here because of the joint meetup. Yeah. Uh, good question. And product managers here may not know that answer because Scrum or Safe t treats it a little bit differently than Scrum traditionally. For us, and I, I don't know the the non-safe definition, the product management organization for us are the people that fundamentally decide. Um, let me give you a very tangible damn, controller saving battery. Um, very tangible thing here. Hopefully it's gonna come up here in a second. Um, they're the ones that say, I wanna do this. The story, not the story, but kind of the small epic. The product owner in, our, again, our organization. So as an example, um, the product owners report to me, typically engineering, um, and they're a part of the Scrum team. The product management reports to an entirely different organization and um, is all about vision. The product owner takes that vision idea, and it's not coming up, sorry. Um, OK, good. So is it safe to say that the product manager is the business representative, and a product owner is a business person in engineering? Close, but maybe not quite. Um, so see, this, this is called a live tile. And a product manager would say, I want this live tile when someone goes here to display this information um, at a high level. Like in that sense, your definition is pretty close. Business, I wanted to show uh, Stanley Cup playoff information. The product owner says, okay, I need to call this API, I need to get that feed, and I need to talk to that group. Okay, so as a user, I would like to see the Stanley Cup playoff. Bam, builds the story, Mo maybe multiple stories depending on how big this is. This is kind of a small chunk. Um, and then, so the product owner, in my case, my product owner is a previous developer who's actually really good at business. He can speak the language and blend the two. Um, my, product, my product owner is an ex-developer who is also the architect, um, is the tech lead, and that business guy. He's kind of unique. One of them is unique. I have another one that is really just not technical at all and breaks it into logical chunks and very program manage it in the sense that, okay, I need to talk to that API to get that or I'll even talk to the developer. Hey, I need to get this information. Who should I talk to? Oh, okay, great. I'll go chase that down, figure out what the specs are, what are my uh, you know, requirements, builds the story around that, and then the dev teams groom them and we'll actually go that deeper level and say, okay, I need these specs, these auths, and whatnot. Is that give you good enough? Okay. So again, traditionally, product management does not sit in this level. Um, some places like to abstract them out completely. Um, we, my groups have embraced it. There's not all project product managers are nice. Um, we are fortunate we're working with a, really, uh, a handful of really good product managers who want us engaged. A lot of, some product managers, at least in our organization, are like, nope, I don't want you to talk to the customer. That's my job. Your job is to build it. My argument is you're wrong a lot of the time. And not because you're not smart, but 
because you hear it from a viewpoint. When a developer hears it, they translate that to, okay, what you're asking for is 3,500 hours of work, but if we pivot, I can cut that by a third. And, and being able to do that, you can go back to the product manager with that knowledge and say, hey, I can do it how you want, and I'll do exactly what you say because you know, that's my job, is to make my product manager happy. He represents the stakeholders in this case. Um, but if you can do it in you know, a 30, 40% savings, it's pretty valuable because now you get more shit done as a product manager. So that's where I think the value of working as a real cohesive team, um, not everybody buys into that. Uh, not every engineer buys into that, and not every product manager buys into that. That's one of the ones we try and work with. So, um, so the program, this is where SAFE gets crazy expensive, in my opinion, um, uh, because there are so many meetings, and you'll see acronyms like WISGIF. I define that a little bit later. Um, but this is that synthesizes the executive grand vision we want to launch a cable competitor. That's kind of a big thing. How do you think we chunk that up? This is the thing that chunks that up into the logical chunks. It says, okay, well, we want to compete with Time Warner, sake of argument. Suppose we need some content to stream. Do we build it? Do we buy it? That kind of happens in this, this layer. I mean, obviously, that one may be a little bit big because in our case, we go to a third party um, to do our, build out our streams and all that kind of stuff. Um, and those are pretty high level contracts negotiated at a very high level. Um, but a lot of the deciding on should we build or buy, it happened in here. The negotiation didn't necessarily happen in here, but the real breaking down of how do we accomplish this got handled here and either handed back up to the executive team to go execute on their side of it or handed down to the scrum teams to be like, okay, we need a client that can display 35 channels of streaming content and be able to switch streams and adaptive bit rating and all that kind of stuff. Go build as a client and they figure out how to do that. Um, the key rules here, RTE, is called a release, that stands for Release Train Engineer. In our organization, that's a PMO person, that's a, product, a program manager, pardon me. Um, and they're just basically the ringmaster of the crazy, because it is a bit of controlling all of the different levers and, and um, keeping the 4,300 confluence pages up to date. They're not, they don't do all of that. There's um, an RTE in our case may have four or five PMs, individuals under them working to help keep the machine lubricated and moving. Um, our UX people sit there, our designers sit there, our systems people sit there. Um, those are all our shared services. So I have here DevOps, system architecture, system engineer, UX design. Um, this is where the product managers uh, sit and go figure out not just the vision and the roadmap, but they take these epics from the senior execs and break them down into something manageable and then work with the stakeholders to figure out what does this really mean. Um, so it's, it's really, the advantages um, are is it keeps us on high level planning and along those objectives instead of an individual developer or scrum team saying, I'm just gonna go work on this because I think it's cool. It's, no, how does, it, how does it fall in here? And then along that lines is prioritizing. Uh, WISGIF, weighted, short, weighted shortest job first. I don't know if this was invented for SAFE or it was taken from somewhere else and used in SAFE. And basically what we try and do with that <clears throat> is the pro product managers take each epic and assign a value to it and they negotiate, they, they go to their stakeholders and say, assign a value to this and stack rank these priorities. And then you add in their t-shirt sizing so you can say, okay, this is priority number two, but it's a small and so for, therefore it can get done first. 
So theoretically, that's a higher value, and so we do that item first. Negotiation happens in that area too. Um, and it allows us to theoretically only work on the stuff that is important. Um, if you have 10 items in your backlog to work on and they're stack ranked, you want to pick the highest value things first. And in some areas, highest values means the biggest revenue return. Um, in some of our areas, it would be the something that limits our downtime. Uh, every outage is calculated to n number of dollars per second is what we look at our downtime and what it costs us as an organization. Um, in my world, uh, in the customer service area, um, the metric's completely different. It's can I get a call center agent off the phone a second faster? Every second costs a, you know, not a dollar, I don't know, maybe 15 cents, 20 cents in real time. And yeah, that doesn't make a lot. We have 200,000 customer service interactions um, a month on the phone. And if you could shave 10 seconds off each one of those, it actually works out to be real money or maybe better, uh, happier customers. Shorter call times typically, if you've done your job reasonably well, mean happier customers. Sometimes it's a screw you, I'm out of here. But we also own a product that is digital crack. So we can get a lot of upset customers. They're not going anywhere. They're going to come back. They're going to buy the next game. They're going to, and, and they're going to stay on our system because all their friends are on our system. And they're not going to move to Xbox because I can't game with all of my friends. Um, I've noticed that with my son. I happen to be a PlayStation person. Funny how that is. We don't have an Xbox anymore. Um, some of his friends are Xbox. He's like, Dad, can we get an Xbox? I'm like, really? Go, go talk to someone else if you want an Xbox. Um, <laughs> So you, you'll find, if you're not a gamer, but your kids are, that you will end up getting the, the system that is actually the ecosystem in that neighborhood or environment. Strange, I used to work at Microsoft, and all those people happen to be Xbox people. Something about giving them away to the employees ha has that effect. Um, so yes, we can not care about our customers. Um, fortunately, our senior management doesn't take that stance. A happy customer, a delighted customer, is you know, someone that will spend more money. So yeah, you may not lose them, but they'll spend less. A happy customer will spend more. And spending more equals more promotions for trip and better bonuses. These are things that do work for me as a motivation tool. Not the only thing, but some of them. Um, any questions on program level? OK. Um, here, I really already talked about this. Um, Sorry, my slide order is not the greatest here. Um, the Agile release train. So basically, we try and keep it no more than 125 people. Um, and we want to have um, as much commonality within that train. There is still some variance. I, I noticed here, and actually, I'll be honest, I stole this slide 100% from an internal slide deck. It's none of my words here. Um, but I was like, wow, this really describes it well. I should put this in. And then I really read this, and I'm like, common cadence? Yeah, we do that. Normalized story point estimating? Not at all. At all. Um, I mean, if you've managed multiple different Scrum teams, you'll notice they find a cadence um, and a, a velocity that works, and they can be wildly different. I have a two-person team that has a velocity of 20. I have a 10-person team that has a velocity of 30. The math doesn't work if you try and bring them together. But they work, and we are not trying to change that. Um, I don't see a value in trying to finesse a fictitious number that's valueless outside of the Scrum team. Um, when we first started Agile, and I don't know if you guys have run into this, we tried to associate velocity to time. This many story points. OK, it's a three-point story. That's four days. Well, the more time you spend into it, there is a correlation, but it's, it's not always that high. Um, I've really found that here, where we get exposure to a lot of other Scrum teams. We see their velocities. We talk about their velocities um, in a way. And I have come to realize it's an irrelevant number outside of that Scrum team directly. It's something they understand and works for them and their 40-point velocity, and I do 10 points, but I deliver twice as much, or 
half as much sometimes. That's where it gets, it, it gets interesting. Um, so we try and operate under a common UX and architectural guideline. Not always successful on the architectural. Um, some of that I think is good. Um, we are a Java shop predominantly, uh, but we are very quickly dabbling into the Node.js world, um, React, um, Go uh, are some of the languages we're starting to adopt. We are breaking, our big backbone projects are Java centric, but any one of these splinter ones is happening on a smaller, quicker framework or language. Um, and traditionally, that was verboten, even inside Sony, regardless of what Safe said. Um, we're very quickly breaking that mold. Um, it keeps our engineers interested. It keeps them learning, keeps them engaged, does enable them to leave easier. I personally see my responsibility is helping all of my people leave the company. And I mean that in the most positive way. If I can't continue to help them grow where they are, then I need to help them go somewhere else and grow there. Um, it's an ecosystem. Uh, when they leave you, they come to me. When they leave me, they come to you. Um, and I'm hopefully hiring the smart people that do well and play well in organizations. Um, so, you know, I just kind of want to personally give back to that. So I want to encourage the taking a flyer, but some places, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, our core commerce platform is Oracle. It's ACID. Every NoSQL says, oh no, we're ACID. No, you're not. You can't prove it. The entire world transactionally works on Oracle. We don't like it. There's problems with it. It's expensive, but it works. So when someone says, hey, I want to do um, Cassandra and have our trans, no. Don't even start that conversation. We're not going there. But in other areas where we don't have to have transactional um, auditing paths, oh, you want to try Cassandra? That's interesting. Have you thought about Couchbase? Oh, and we're doing AWS, so DynamoDB might be a better solution. What about Dynamo? OK, let's try that. So we allow for a lot of variance in certain areas, other areas, not so much. Um, for commerce, for us, if you're familiar with PCI compliance, which is the uh, payment card industry, uh, protecting card, card numbers, and it's quite onerous of a um, architecture, so it's a little bit difficult. Um, so that's what the, the train is that I've talked about, PlayStation, commerce, and whatnot. Um, it's basically, you know, we run, they say every 8 to 12 weeks, we do 12 at SAE. Uh, SAE. Um, it works for us. Any question? Yes. Um, that really ties to the WSGIF. Um, the object, uh, 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 excuse me, objective evaluations is what's the value of this story, and um, how does that stack up against the other work that's happening. So one of the things that happens, and I notice I'm running a little long, so I'll talk about planning, is in planning, it's a ton of grooming, weeks and weeks of grooming. Um, in one group, we uh, every eight weeks, we're in Tokyo grooming with Japan. Uh, it gets tiring real quick. Um, and that's so that when these stories come out, they're well-defined, and we can act on them. So this is, um, OK. So on a planning day, we, the business context is the one I talked about where senior management gives you that big story that you're happy with, and you, you're like, yeah, that's great. And then you talk about, at the lower level, here's what we're going to do. The product managers give the overview of their objectives. Um, you know, some of the requirements around planning. Teams do their breakout. They do, it, it is literally chaos um, because there's constant negotiation of, hey, I need this. When can you deliver it? Right? And then it gets down to draft plan review. Not that interesting. This is where it gets down to, I think I might answer your question, or I hope I answer your question. Um, all the managers go into a room and say, okay, this is what we're doing. And this is where a product manager or someone like myself says, um, I can't deliver because that group won't give me what I need. 
and our uh, senior vice president who owns all the engineering resources looks at me and says, they made the right choice. Oh, damn it, hate that. But what that allows me to do is not spend 12 weeks working on something that will never get shipped because what I needed were servers set up in a data center and they are busy on other higher priority objects, uh, uh, objectives. So being able to say, look, Trip, I respect that your stuff is really important to you. I have Christmas coming and I need 3,000 more servers online to be able to handle the load. Your project is not as critical as that. And I can go, yeah, you're right. And I feel way better about not getting my stuff. That's where those things come in. WizGF helps that. Um, but also in the planning review, uh, this is, in fact, I talk about it here because of the planning, there's a lot of wasted time in here. My teams are done planning at about 105. We don't have a lot of interdependencies. We get it done quickly. We pre-plan it. We come in and then the team goes out and we go drinking that night. It's a little bit easier for us. Um, other teams are sweat knit because this management review comes and then you get to day two and you replan everything you planned that day because you found out your core dependency is not going to be delivered. So how do you do that? Um, that's why planning's two days. Typically, we're done mid-afternoon with our planning. Um, there are some groups that take a lot longer. So um, I brought, sorry, I'll just. Does that every 12 weeks? Yes, every 12 weeks, um, about 500 people coalesce in San Diego. Most of the, the, those 500 are San Diegans, so not a big deal. But there's about 100 that travel. I'm one of them from LA, it's not a big deal. Um, all of our Japanese teams and our English teams and our Canadian teams and our Wisconsin teams, every single one. SAFE is very expensive, at least for us. Um, uh, every single person either goes to San Diego or San Francisco. If you've looked for a hotel in San Francisco, you know how damn expensive that is. Uh, $400 a night to be an hour drive away from your, the San Francisco office. It costs us a lot of money to do this, but it's what has made us be able to deliver that value. Because you walk out of there and you know you can get your work done within reason for 12 weeks. You are unimpeded. Or you know what your roadblocks are and you work on it. Each release train does it? Um, yes, and each release train will take a room you know, of this size and pile in or even bigger. Um, and in San Diego, we do, there's actually now four trains that do it in San Diego because they're mostly San Diego based. And then in San Francisco, there's uh, one train up there. Um, all at the same time. It's challenging. I own teams on two different trains. I flip a coin and go, where's my time's going to be best spent? Because you can't split. I've tried it, doesn't work. Um, the real value's in day one, and that's where you need to be. It's in this management review. It's where I can stand up and say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is critical and here's where it is and it's my one opportunity to sway a vote uh, and, and get attention where it's needed. I typically lose because, again, I'm not responsible for the revenue side of things. I'm responsible for costs. So it's easy to punt some of my dependencies. So, all right. Um, so some of the tools we use, our primary tools are um, we use the hell out of Slack. Um, one of the nice things about Slack is we will create specific channels on a feature. So if you're part of a feature team and you, there may be seven different scrum teams working on the same feature with different APIs, it's a great way to communicate. I'm not a Slack salesman, but I am a convert. Um, Rally is our tool for story management, epics, stories, tasks. Um, I'm agnostic on the tool. I don't live in it, so I'm agnostic. A lot of people like it, some people don't. Um, Confluence. I'm not kidding when I say we probably have 10,000 Confluence pages, and there's, n and, oh, and we have four different instances of Confluence, and you're not sure what instance to go to to get to the page you need. So that's something we're, I'm going to try and use safe to get us closer to. So everybody do it the same way. I alluded to this. Um, everybody travels, but like the PlayStation train is the only one that does this. We do spec fix and spec lock meetings six weeks prior to planning. So we all travel, uh, smaller groups do, so the engineers don't travel. We all either travel to San Francisco um, or Tokyo, and it rotates every time, um, to sit down and hash out the differences in the firmware and hardware teams. That's 
pretty critical for us, and that makes success. Um, no other trains do that. Um, and we do adjust to the realities. Demos, we yanked a bunch of that out. Um, and some teams come 100% planned. One of my teams is able to do 95% of the planning prior to planning, so it becomes maybe a wasted day. But you never know, because you're sitting there and someone walks in and says, oh, by the way, I need this. And you can address it, instead of an email that got typed but not sent or lost in the ether. Um, so here's the thing. Planning initially costs us about 1,550 man days of time. Uh, we adjusted that to about 1,125. So it's a 28% savings. Not a huge savings, but when you say, that's three years. That's one planning. We do four of those a year. That's a lot. And we cut it by 400 man days? Seven years. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Ooh, bad math. There's not 500 days in a year, is there? Um, and Jupiter there is. Yeah. There you go. Um, so... This is an adaptation we did not to save time, but to actually have unfrustrated uh, consumers of the process. Um, uh, so we've done a lot of way with the team attendance meetings, scrum of scrums, uh, it gets onerous and becomes valueless. Um, uh, scrum of trains, that's where all the scrum masters from all the trains get together. It just becomes chaos. Um, so what that's done for us is given us more confluence it's a separate side of this different problem. Um, so it's a little bit of a change. Any questions? That's about it. Oh, summary. There we go. So overall, do I like safe? Yes. I'm glad we did it. There are other ways we could have solved it. We had a couple of things in process prior to this that, oddly enough, agnostic of safe was very similar in our planning and how we tried to do planning. Wasn't nearly as effective, though. This worked because top down, everybody bought into it. Um, so it's, it's yeah. heavyweight, high startup costs, I, you know, not startup costs in the licensing, but traveling, lots of travel, since we're so co-located or so disparate located. Um, if you're all, um, Mitchell is a large organization in San Diego, is predominantly all in San Diego. Their costs are a lot lower to do this. There are, Man, day, man hour costs are high, but they don't have the same travel expenses we have. Um, it enables for predictability. The entire organization knows what you're doing. And in highly interconnected development groups like PlayStation Network, where every piece is interdependent on another piece, this is critical. Um, and then, so Safe.0, 4.0, we use Safe 3. Here are some of the common things, uh, the slight differences. Basically, SAFE 4.0 addresses organizations even larger than our own. So Microsoft, Apple, Google would look to do a SAFE 4.0. As we grow, we might get there. I don't think we'll do it. It addresses even larger trains and higher volumes of people. And that's it. And then I did a quick little alphabet soup because I'm bad at using acronyms. And my boss is always yelling at me, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh. I thought everybody knew what a portfolio, a PSC was. So, any questions I can answer? Any? Yes. I'm just a lowly engineer, and it sounds like in my company where you do this, uh, my day to day life, uh, set of the planning roughly the same. Roughly it is. Yeah, I think it's real fair to say that as an a average engineer, your life doesn't change a lot except for the planning meetings. Some engineers love it, they get to travel. They get to use expense accounts they have but never use. Um, we, do, it, we use it as an opportunity um, to go to team dinners and do not traditional team building stuff. We spend a lot of time together. Um, our teams have become, at least the ones I work with, much more cohesive in this environment. You spend a lot more time together on some of these things and you can bond. So I think that value is there. Um, but to each his own. Yes? I mean, you know, have you actually seen you know, businesses tend to do this, right? They'll institute initiatives, uh, pat each other on the back for how successful it is, yeah. but don't actually go back and run the numbers and say, you know, the increase in travel was X number of millions of dollars per year, but our productivity went up by this amount, yep. we delivered this amount faster, and so overall the business is this, more, this much more efficient. I mean, 
have you guys actually done that and shown that this actually is? Um, yes. I am not, I haven't really dug into those numbers. Um, my metrics are slightly different. Um, my customers aren't pissed off anymore. I no longer hear that Tokyo just doesn't like working with you guys because you don't deliver. We had different objectives, different deliverables. Um, we don't anymore. And we were fixing that a little bit on our own prior to SAFE. This, I think, accelerated it quite a bit. So, you know, there's some metrics I didn't use because they're considered confidential, but one of the things were a statement was said that we've delivered four times more value in half the time. It's not a solid metric, but it's much higher because we're actually delivering value. I don't think you can divorce those for one reason. We didn't travel before this. We wouldn't have traveled without this. So yes, we could have done this. We didn't. And our organization is eight years old. So I'd say yes, we could have, but this, was a, this is a forcing function that helped cause it. And we are now starting to cut those costs, trying to do a little less travel, be a little bit smarter and whatnot, and some of the optimizations we've made. Yes. Did your company look at other options besides safe for scaling Agile or? There was some evaluations. I was not involved in those. So I, I don't know how widely we honestly looked at other things. Um, I'll be honest. I think we were in a really bad spot. I don't think we had time to do much evaluation. We needed to do something and do it fast um, because we were very quickly uh, becoming each other's worst enemies. Um, and by each other, I mean the Tokyo organization and the American organization. And, you know, you could say some of that is cultural, but it really was, they weren't, del they weren't delivering what we wanted, and they, we weren't delivering what they wanted. So we were equally unhappy, yet we had the same end goal. So it really was determined, um, I don't know how it came about, but I don't think we had a lot of time to do the traditional, well, let's th sit and think about this and hire consultants. And, you know, in a year from now, we'll get to this. The first time I heard about SAFE was early December, and our first train of actually starting using SAFE was February. Um, and I was in the first group to be inoculated into it. So um, it moved really fast. <laughs>